Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things as yet unseen. That's where we left off last week in Hebrews chapter 11, the beautiful faith chapter. And surely that chapter must have been an inspiration to the famous hymn writer Fanny Crosby, who spent almost all of her 95 years on earth without seeing. She was completely blind. You see, as a baby, Fanny Crosby had an eye infection that was treated by an incompetent con man posing as a doctor in 1820 New York. And the treatment left her completely without sight for the rest of her life. Now, that obstacle didn't stop Fanny from composing more than 9,000 hymns over the course of her life many of which include the most popular hymns of the 19th and 20th century, even to today. Blessed assurance, Jesus keep me near the cross, to God be the glory, and dozens of others still in popular usage today. About her blindness, Fanny once said this, it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for the dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might have not sung hymns to praise God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things around me. If I had a choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. That sounds like faith, doesn't it? With so much in her own repertoire, you might find it interesting that at least one of the hymns at her funeral in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1915 was not written by Crosby herself. It was written by the Englishman Frederick William Faber. See if you can spot these lyrics. Faith of our fathers living still. In spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whene'er we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. No follower of Christ exercises faith in a vacuum. The faith we hold today is the faith of those who have gone before us to the extent that it is faith placed in the same God who gives the same call to live for his glory and the same word by which we are instructed to live. Our faith is the faith of our fathers, maybe our spiritual mom or dad, or maybe our biological. In so many ways, we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. Whether it's the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11 or heroes like Fanny Crosby, God uses these lives not only to ignite our faith, but to grow our faith. Because he doesn't want us to remain infants in Christ forever, but to grow in him. When we began this series on faith, I told you there were two reasons I had for selecting this particular theme for this particular time. The first was the link between faith and repentance, repentance being the series we had just spent 15 weeks studying with Pastor Derek. The first was that link because repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. So Hebrews chapter 6 describes the foundation of Christian doctrine as being repentance from dead works and faith toward God. In turning away from something, it means turning to something else. In this case, something much, much better. The second reason was that we need faith as a church family to move forward into what God has for us in the future. You just heard Pastor Derek talking about where we're going to be in two weeks' time and where God has for us beyond that. Managing his increase is growing ministry to match it. But growing ministry requires growing disciples. So let me read that passage to you in Hebrews 6 in its full context. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ 
and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God and instruction about washings and laying of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are the basics. But he doesn't want us to stay there. And we will do this, if God permits, to teach you how to grow in Christ, says the writer to the Hebrews. God doesn't want our faith to be static or remain where it began. He wants us to grow and mature as believers. So as we conclude our series on faith this morning, I want to leave you with three simple principles of maturing faith. I want you to see how the faith of our fathers handed down to us is meant to develop in us, growing and maturing as disciples. What is faith supposed to look like as it grows in the life of the believer? What is the evolution of faith, to put it provocatively? To discover that, we'll need to look at Paul's letter to the Colossians. So please turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. You have your Bibles with you. If you don't, there's a pew Bible right in front of you. Colossians chapter 2. I want to read for you verses 6 and 7 this morning. These are the encapsulation, the summary of the book of Colossians, with chapter 1 being a lengthy introduction, the subsequent chapters unraveling what Paul has to say. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2 form the core of his message to this church. Colossians chapter 2, beginning to read up verse 6. This is God's word. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. First thing I'd like you to notice with me this morning is that faith begins with a step, but it becomes a walk. Faith begins with a step, but it becomes a walk. As far as we know, Paul never visited the Colossian church. Colossae was a once great, now relatively small city, about 100 miles from Ephesus and about 10 miles from Laodicea, on an important trade route. The implication from the scriptures and what we know in chapter 1 is that a Colossian man named Epaphras heard Paul preach the gospel while on a trip to Ephesus. Epaphras came to Christ there, and he was the one, most likely trained by Paul, who took the gospel back to his home, Colossae, and planted a church there. So Paul is now writing to this church from prison, the church already planted, mostly Gentile believers, to encourage them to grow and to guard against fall teaching. Remember, though, that they are one step removed from Paul's ministry itself. So the faith of Paul has been passed to Epaphras and now is passed to the Colossians, the gospel being handed down and passed on like the faith of our fathers. That's why the words used in verse 6 are particularly significant because Paul says, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord. Now, obviously, he's talking about when they became Christians. But he's not specifically referring to their regeneration here. He does talk about repentance and faith back in chapter 1 and verse 4, where he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and he goes on to commend them. He talks about their union with Christ in chapter 1 and verse 27, when he says, the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Here, however, he uses the phrase received Christ, and this word received is the word typically used for the passing of a tradition. So Paul's talking about their acceptance of the content of the faith as a noun when they exercise their faith as a verb in Christ. You see what I mean? He's not referring to the Colossian believers inviting Jesus into their hearts, as we like to say when we talk about someone receiving Christ, even though that is the first step. Paul acknowledges this first step in chapter 1 and lots of other places in his writings. Here, he's, he's talking about learning that becoming a Christian 
involves committing to a way of life and a tradition of belief and practice that is being handed down from the apostles to the new believers across Asia and the rest of the world. See, Paul is concerned that these new believers are not believing the wrong thing. Or worse yet, believing the right thing for the wrong reason. And that can happen pretty easily. Lots of times, you might find a person who professes to be a Christian, but doesn't believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Namely, the Son of God. The Messiah sent from the Father. There are people who profess to be Christians who don't believe that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, the resurrection in a physical body. Yet the resurrection was one of the principal doctrines that got the apostles in so much trouble as the church was being formed. Maybe you've encountered someone who professes to be a Christian, but doesn't seem to acknowledge or understand that apart from the work of Christ, they themselves are guilty and corrupt and lost in sin. But how can you repent if you don't believe you need repenting? Now, it's not my place or yours to judge someone's heart. That is God's business. But the point is that Paul is saying here, there are true things about the world, about your own sinful nature, about who Jesus is and what he has done, there is doctrine, there is a tradition, there is a content that goes with faith, that comes along with it. It's a continuation of teaching, but not a tradition of men. You see, it's the received doctrine, the same way that the Old Testament scriptures were passed on uh, generation after generation quite meticulously. Now Christ is the tradition. It's not a tradition of men. See, that is what Paul was defending against. If you look down just one verse to verse 8, you will see what he says. Look at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul is concerned that their faith has the right content, that the tradition being handed down to them is Jesus, not some concoction of men. Now, Jesus himself had the same concern. Remember back in Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees criticized Jesus' disciples for not following the tradition that had been handed down through the ages. The problem was the tradition they were handing down was moving further and further away from the intent of God and was increasingly becoming a creation of men. Listen to what Mark 7 says, beginning at verse 5. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, that's Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat their bread with impure hands. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, verse 9, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. So Paul wants to ensure that the Colossian church is receiving the right tradition, so he reminds them what gospel they received. And in verse 6, what is that? You received Christ Jesus as Lord. Christ Jesus as Lord. Jesus is Lord is used by Paul more than 230 times in his writings to describe the essence of the gospel. Jesus is Lord is the tradition we have received. Jesus is Lord is the faith of our fathers. Jesus is Lord, Christ over all, superior to all, worthy above all, worthy of all our submission, worship, obedience, and praise. Jesus is Lord. Lord. And because he is Lord, I am not Lord. You are not Lord. Because he is Lord, he can save us from our sin. Because he is Lord, he can promise us eternal life. 
Because he is Lord, he is preparing a place now for those who love him. Because he is Lord, we have an inheritance shared with him. The hope of glory that we talked about last week in Hebrews 11. Hope not seen by the heroes of the faith, but that they were waiting for. The promise of God. Hope for a future. Bright with the Father. And available to all who would receive the truth about his son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So faith begins as a step, a step of trusting God to save us from our desperate condition that we're in, but it doesn't end there. Along with it comes the content of that faith, the truth about who Jesus is, and it doesn't end there either, because as a function of the lordship of Christ, Paul tells us we must then walk in him. Faith begins as a step, but it becomes a walk. Obedience flows out of expressed belief. Obedience flows out of faith. And so in verse 6 here, the summary of Paul's whole letter to the Colossians, he encompasses both the internal conviction and the external expression of the tradition of faith. Receiving Christ as Lord of all and walking in him as obedient servants to the master. That's why Paul wrote to the Galatian church, if we live by the Spirit, we must also walk in the Spirit. That's Galatians 5.25. My old track coach at McGill used to love to say to us, if you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. You've heard that, right? If you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. The content of our, of our actions needs to match the profession of our mouth. It doesn't, doesn't just work in athletics, but it sure does work there. You better back up what you say you're going to do with what you actually do. But one thing I found to be true is that I, as I matured as an athlete, the, it, what came out of my mouth became more and more accurate and I became less and less dependent on it and more and more dependent upon my actions, the way I actually performed to demonstrate my prowess as an athlete. That just came with maturity. Paul is inviting the Colossians to come along on this journey towards Christian maturity. He says this explicitly in the context that leads up to these verses, to our text today. Back in chapter 1, just back one page in verse 28. Look at chapter 128. Him we proclaim, says Paul, him of course is Jesus, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, handing down faith, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Faith begins as a step, but it becomes a walk as you grow in him and gain full stride in the tradition of faith you have received. So how do we grow? How do we grow? Well, that's the second point. Faith begins where you are, but it grows deeper and higher. Faith begins where you are, but grows deeper and higher. As we move to verse 7, Paul now turns to three metaphors to describe the maturing of faith. The first is agricultural, the second is architectural, and the third is legal. Three metaphors. First of all, rooted. How are we to walk in this process of living and maturing in Christ? Be rooted in him, says Paul. The tense of the verb rooted here suggests a once for all planting of the believer. And of course, we're planted in Christ. The image of the roots is the image of a tree stretching its roots down deep into an expansive network that holds the tree in place. But the roots have another function, don't they? Their function goes beyond just holding the tree in the ground. Also, it gets its nourishment from the ground, doesn't it? The roots have access to water. So isn't it interesting that Paul presents the image of Christians being rooted in Christ who has living water for us, for the nourishment of our soul and the growth of our spirit by faith. That's why the prophet Jeremiah says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Remember our first 
message three weeks ago about David expounding the idea of trusting in the Lord, faith extending all the way back into the Old Testament story and traced through the New Testament to Christ. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the water, says Jeremiah, that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Roots are required for stability. Roots are required for refreshment and nourishment. The roots are also required for the tree to bear fruit. And bearing fruit is the mark of a maturing Christian, so the scriptures tell us. So Paul's teaching us how to grow in our faith. Begin by letting your roots go down deep into Christ. He's the one in whom we put our trust for salvation. So hold on tightly to him and get ready to go deep with him. Then Paul turns to to, uh, architecture. He starts with agriculture. He moves to architecture. Not just the roots going down, but you being built up. The tense of this verb is the present tense which suggests a continual building process, meaning continual growth in the life of the disciple. Of course, you know the New Testament writers love to use the architectural metaphor of Christ as the foundation, the cornerstone of the building. The Old Testament writers love it too. That's where we got the the metaphor in the first place. So Jesus says the wise man builds his house on on the rock. And Paul says to the Corinthian church, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Starting from him, the maturing Christian grows and builds like a tall building, increasing in stature, solid in place because of the foundation on which it stands. Because Jesus really is the one doing the building, isn't he? He's really the one doing the building. Paul says, you're rooted in him, and you're being built up in him, and what? Established in your faith. New Living Translation puts that, your faith will grow strong. Because the word for established there, or growing strong, is a legal term. Literally, that means to be settled. It was used to talk about a guarantee required for the exchange of property. So it's like the conditions of sale are being removed. The bank financing has come through. The deal's firm. Everything is settled. And as you grow, you become more settled in your faith. Remember the old disciples who asked Jesus, increase our faith? This is how it happens. He is the one who will do it. So if we lay back on the tree metaphor, if we combine, collapse it into one metaphor, because the Bible loves to mix metaphors, and that's, that's how it's written, and I think it's good. But just take the tree by itself for a moment and think about the tree anchoring itself as it grows. It starts as a small seed, maybe as small as a mustard seed. Then the roots start to go down deeper into Christ and take in living water from him. Then the branches start to extend high and the tree grows and spreads out as it thrives, bearing fruit because the water comes up through the roots and nourishes the leaves and produces a harvest. And what happens to the trunk of the tree as the roots go down and the branches grow taller? The trunk of the tree gets thicker, doesn't it? And stronger and more established. That's your faith growing stronger with the maturity that comes from walking in Christ. So we too, like the Colossians, can grow to maturity in our faith If we walk in Christ, being rooted and built up in him, growing stronger in the faith, just as you were taught, says Paul. There's the handing down, the handing down of the faith tradition, receiving the whole truth about Jesus, and that starts everything in motion. That's really cool. I think that's amazing. Faith begins as a step, but it becomes a walk. Faith begins where you are, maybe just a tiny, tiny seed. But it goes deeper and it goes higher with Christ. 
So really quickly, number three. Faith begins as a life of trust, but it becomes a life of worship. Faith begins as a life of trust, but it becomes a life of worship. You remember we talked about David and the all-encompassing trust that he had in God that he wrote about in the Psalms. And that was true, and that was good, and that was where it began. And that was the way that we started to understand what faith actually means in our life. But faith doesn't stop as just a life of trust. It moves to a life of worship. This past Friday, I had the chance to go fishing with my two boys and their cousin, Uncle Jeff, and my dad. We like to do this when we go to his place. And so we gathered up all the gear. We got all the stuff. And they put on all their special fishing clothes and their special fishing hats, and they were juiced and ready to go when we trekked down to the the mighty river. Excitement in preparation, three rods, three boys, and a bag full of worms. (laughs) Five minutes in, probably less than five minutes, Nixon caught the first fish. Woo! Yes, we're not going home (laughs) empty-handed. We got something. But now, of course, the other two boys are waiting for for something too, right? Well, after what seemed like six or eight hours, which was really about 25 minutes, (laughs) Titus caught a beautiful striped bass that he was really wanting to catch. Another success, another proud boy, but no fish yet for little Josiah. And so it stayed as the clock ticked on. Boys getting tired and hungry, Morning turns to late afternoon, not a fish in sight, but Josiah had faith. Finally, all the worms were gone. Started packing up the gear, folded all the chairs, put everything in the trailer, ready to head back. Everything was wrapped up, except Uncle Jeff was determined to help Josiah catch a fish. And so with the last worm hanging limp off of that hook, because he'd been thrown out so many times, <laughs> they made one final cast into that river. And as they're reeling the line in, ready to pack it up for another day, the rod started to wobble and bend. And it was a fish. And they brought it in, and that third catch of the day, you can only imagine the pandemonium that ensued. Boys were screaming and jumping. Adults were giving each other high fives. It was pure, unadulterated joy that could not be contained because of this last fish. Why am I telling you this? When Paul talks about abounding in thanksgiving in verse 7, this is the kind of thing he's talking about. He's not talking about, yeah, thanks, we really appreciate it. He's talking about abundant thanksgiving, overflowing gratitude, a bursting and brimming response that could only be described as a rich worship experience and relationship with the God that comes from faith that has matured and deepened and grown strong in Christ himself. The evolution of faith is worship because worship flows out of faith. Worship extends into eternity with God, our eternal vocation, worshiping him, falling at his feet, calling out glory to his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fueled by increasing knowledge of and likeness to the Savior that is perfected in glory. That is what the future holds for us who believe. See, faith begins a simple trust, believing God, taking him at his word, that's one thing accepting who I am and my lostness in sin and accepting the offer of redemption from the only one who can do anything about it and save me. But that's just the beginning of the relationship. The more I get to know this God, the more I get to know this Savior, this Jesus, the more I exercise faith as he empowers me to do so and grow in his grace that leads me into the blessed submission of all that I am. And all that I have to him as I come to realize that there's so much more that he has for me. And all I can do is say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Our children trust us from a very early age. I've said that before. I've used it as an example before. A child has faith in his parents from very early on. 
But isn't it beautiful to watch the simple trust relationship evolve into a, a relationship that is more complex as they grow older? And if God grants a relationship with, with him at the center that becomes rich in mutual respect and even friendship extending into adulthood and beyond, that's God's design for that relationship. But if a parent can develop a rich and rewarding relationship with their child as they grow and blossom into adulthood, how much more can the God of the universe enrich and flourish the relationship with his children who are maturing in him and sold out to him by faith in his marvelous grace? Faith that starts as simple trust for rescue from desperation grows into a life of worship. That's why I like the way that William Temple defined worship. He said, worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the most selfless expression of which our nature is capable. Paraphrase that. Thank you, Lord. Fanny Crosby took faith to get from desperation and disability to championing the cause of Christ through her pen. Faith took David from a shepherd boy to the champion of God's army, king over Israel and a man after God's own heart. Faith took Noah from a lone voice preaching God's righteousness to a corrupt generation to inherit that very righteousness for himself and receive one of God's richest promises. Faith took the apostles from a ragtag band of misfits. And, and, and people who were cast out by society and ridiculed and rejected to the forges of a revolution of love at the most unexpected time in history from a cowering clan of disciples to bold martyrs willing to die for the master. And faith takes followers of that master from a tiny step to a confident walk. From a minuscule seed to a towering tree with deep and expansive roots from childlike trust to a worship relationship with the God of all creation that cannot be contained. Where, oh where, will faith take you? The answer is anywhere God wants you to go. Because faith in our God can overcome any obstacle. It can conquer any foe, subdue any temptation, beat any diagnosis because it knows that God is sovereign and even if he places it in your path now, he will see you through with the glorious hope of things that are yet unseen. That faith can heal brokenness. That faith can mend any relationship, trample any fear, build any building, fill three services, expand a building. Faith in this God is unstoppable because he is Lord of all. If you want that kind of faith, ask him. Ask him because he is waiting for you to grow. And if you don't know him this morning, you can take that first step of faith if you're willing to stop trying to do it yourself and make Jesus Lord of your life because he is Lord of all. Let's pray. Mighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of faith and for your call to those who would receive it along with the whole truth of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his incredible sacrifice for us. Thank you for life abundant. We say to you out of the abundance of our hearts, thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace and favor and love. We give you praise and honor and glory and worship this morning.
In Jesus' name.